Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second edition of our NatWest um, in association with Thai Live Interviews. If you tuned in last week, you would have heard from uh, Steve Byrne from uh, Travel Counselors, and uh, what a session it, it was! Um, really insightful. I've had loads of feedback around, you know, the session that. Uh, um, VCAS held with with Steve and this this week plans to be no different um, at all. For those of you who uh, don't know me, uh, I'm Dale Sybottom. I'm one of the regional directors for uh, the NatWest entrepreneurship team and at NatWest we are really really proud of the work that we are doing supporting business leaders and entrepreneurs throughout the uh, UK. Last week I talked a little bit around some of the programs that we operate under the NatWest um, banking umbrella and you know i would prompt you this week to really go ahead and visit our natwest.com um, website and search for entrepreneur where you can really learn about all the programs that we offer um, as support we really do understand at this time it's really unprecedented time that the business the economy is is facing so it's sessions like these when we gain from experts when we gain that insight that can really help be really thought-provoking and uh, this this week plans to be uh, no different so without further ado i'm going to hand over to our host again uh, vcas who's going to take you through um this week's session vcas over to you great thank you very much dale and um welcome back everyone for our second edition of of this lovely evening tea and talk with a successful entrepreneur so today's guest is Kat Lewis. So Kat's the CEO, Joint Creative Director and Executive Producer at Nine Lives Media. So she's worked as a network executive producer since 2002, and she's delivered hundreds of network TV programs, you know, lots of shows that we've all enjoyed, and we'll, we'll hear all about that a bit later on. So Kat's also a BAFTA judge. She's the former chair of the Royal Television Society in the Northwest, former chair of PACT, which is TV's national trade body, and chair of the Indie Club, which was set up in 2006 um, to increase communication across the sector and to retain a talent pool in the North. And actually through Indie Club, you know, Kat successfully campaigned for Ofcom to actually tighten the criteria which regulates the Made Outside London productions to ensure that every program creates jobs and leaves an economic legacy. So Kat was also awarded an honorary doctorate at Selfridge University in 2016 for creating so many jobs in the North. And she's a global ambassador for Manchester. So we're really privileged to have Kat with us today. So welcome. Hi, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Great. So, so I thought we'd start by talking about the fact that obviously, you know, the media is a business that relies on people gathering to make things, whether it's in studios or on location or everywhere and anywhere else. So, you know, when did you first realize that this pandemic was going to be a real challenge and not just kind of something over there? And how did you respond to it straight away? Well, it was um, probably about the beginning of March. Um, I was watching the news as everybody else was and seeing what was happening in other countries. And I thought, my pregnant production manager, you know, needs to go home. My staff who've got diabetes, my staff who have got health conditions. So we actually kind of effectively went into lockdown about 10 days before. In fact, my um, production manager I sent home about two weeks before the official wow. lockdown. Um, and then we got a call from the BBC because we make Songs of Praise, mm -hmm. which is brilliant because it's a year round commission. Um, so we won that um, back in 2017. It used to be made in-house at the BBC and it was a competitive tender and lots of independents around the country went for it. And we were the ones that got it. And it's a co-production between Nine Lives and Avanti, who are based in Wales. Okay. And my co-exec um, is an expert in music programming and event programming. And I'm an expert in factual programming. So it's a really good marriage. So they've now yeah. got two executive producers who've got that individual expertise. Um, so, so basically, we got a phone call from the BBC. We need you to make um, lots of songs of praise very, very quickly. You know? And I kind of sat down and kind of, yeah. I kind of thought, and then, and then we actually sold in an idea to do a new programme called Sunday Worship because, you know, all the churches were closing. Yeah. And it was as if the BBC had a week's notice of, of official lockdown. 
So it was just as we'd all kind of come home, the vulnerable staff had gone home the week before. This was around the 16th of March. And so we were, we were told essentially, you've got a week, you've got to make programs that are gonna go through probably mm. until the end of June. And so we did a schedule, we had 12 programs to make. Fortunately, I've got a big team, so delegated out scripts. We literally made 12 programs in a week. We had all wow. our, well, we shot 12 programs. But what we had to do is we just had to use everybody's creativity to think about how highlight programs would work. That seemed the best way to proceed. So we would get the reporter to do the links, um, well, not reporter, sorry, presenter. So we had Alid doing two in a day. Catherine Jenkins allowed us to go to her beautiful house um, that was out, out of London. We did two programs, sets of programs links with her, Reverend Kate Botley, you know, mm -hmm. so we just, we shot it all and we then had to edit it, but the time pressure wasn't as bad for editing. So that, that's how we did it. And then we also oh. um, created this new series, Sunday Worship, that my, my um, co-exec looked after that one, but that was made from scratch, 12, yeah. 12 programs in a week. <laughs> wow. And, and I only found out the other day that you also had COVID yourself. You know, what was, what was that experience like for you? And also, you know, did, did having it make you reflect on the measures that are in place right now? It really did. It's a really good question. So what happened is we were in the middle of um, still kind of, you know, viewing and, and script um, editing and everything that I do as my job, you know, along with the series producer and the producers of the individual episodes. And this was about the 24th. My birthday is the 23rd of March, the start of lockdown. It was the next day. That's why I remember it so clearly. So 24th, I woke up feeling ill. And we'd had a takeaway the night before and I was thinking, oh, that was probably a really bad idea. And um, and I just, you know, got worse. And um, I think that was the Wednesday and the Thursday, Friday, I couldn't get out of bed. But I was still, I have to admit, working in bed, doing these viewings and scripts and things. Um, but I was taking breaks and fortunately I'd almost finished everything we needed to do at that stage. Um, and um, yeah, and then what happened is I did actually carry on working, but... Um, I just had the stuffing knocked out of me. That's what it does to people. Yeah. I was just really, really exhausted. And so it, I wasn't myself for about 30 days. So it's definitely worth avoiding because you just don't know how it's going to affect you. Yeah. We don't know whether it's a blood you know, problem or whether it's kind of, um, it's certainly not just respiratory. And I lost yeah. my sense of smell totally. And to be honest, it hasn't fully come back. Really? It's come back, I would say, about eighty percent, but you know, maybe seventy percent. It's not. It's not as it was. Wow. And also, I think you know, one one of the things that's really fascinated me through all this is how the government's kind of responded to the needs of specific industries, because it's highlighted that every industry is needed almost a different flavour of specific support on top of the furlough programmes and so on. You know, in your view, you know, how how well or not has the government actually supported? creative industries and the media through this crisis? We're quite a spoilt industry in that um, we are project based. Mm -hmm. And in the old days, you know, people used to be employed year round, even though we are a project based business. Um, Songs of Praise obviously is on year round, so we can employ people year round, that's fine. But with other programmes, we tend to rely on a lot of freelance staff. So we bring them in to make the programme then they go off. And the idea is, and the reason I've fought so hard for television to be made across the country and not just in London, apart from the fact that that's what the law insists should happen, the Communications Act 2003, but apart from that, the reason I, I need a talent pool up here and everybody else running an independent production company needs one is because we need to have enough jobs to have that yeah. freelance talent pool because otherwise they all go to London, they have to. And so, you know, the freelancers are really important and unfortunately they have fallen through the cracks. So although I think the Chancellor's done a wonderful job for businesses in terms of furlough, yeah. you know, seems brilliant, you know, but for, for freelance staff, sorry, that's the ice cream ban outside, if you can hear that. Um, yeah, that's a, well, that, that's, all, that's never a bad thing to have down your road, so that's all good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so basically um, the, a lot of freelancers haven't been able to get, um, you know, the, uh, kind of any kind of financial benefit. And it's been like 12 weeks. So if people, you know, didn't have savings, they're on universal credit, literally. So it's just, it's just been so difficult. But do you think that's also going to change, you know, how employment's structured in media? Because, you know, like you said, so many people that work in the creative industries are freelance and the industries depend on those freelancers. But, but do you think this, this whole pandemic could perhaps 
put people off coming into media because of what they've seen? Or do you think it might encourage media businesses to change their employment model completely? My model is a mix. So I have a core staff at Nine Lives of around about 10 people, including myself and mm. my husband. Um, but beyond that, you know, it is good to have freelance people coming in and out. Um, I have some staff, um, particularly Sonny Kang, who's been with me since he left college. And he yeah. is now, you know, a really good series producer. So I've literally taken him every step of the way up to that 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 position. Um, but it's kind of, it's really hard because uh, a lot of people want to be freelance. They want to be able to go for the best project. It's a bit like if you're an artist and you're offered like three different, you know, um, portraits to paint and you get to choose whose portrait you paint you know what I mean so it's like a lot of freelancers want to be able to move from company to company a lot of people who are brilliant at what they do they want to create a new series yeah. and if they get really good at it that's all they want to do they don't want to kind of do series two series three they want to do series one here then another series another idea there and and the reason why we operate the way we do is because why would you have the same artist painting every portrait in a gallery painting every picture can imagine <laughs> that's how the BBC used to work you know, yeah. surely you want to have the best artists all over the country so we can take yeah. our ideas to the BBC and they can choose from the, all the ideas they receive from everybody. And did you, can you know, I know we're going to come to your, your career a little bit later on in this, but was that also part of how, how you found your way in media? You know, did you find that actually that diversity of projects early on helped you kind of create your own aesthetic, your own narrative and decide, you know, what aspect of, of media you wanted to be involved in? I always love true stories. So mm. when I was a kid, you know, if I was watching a film on the telly and it said, this is a true story, I, it was my story, you know, I loved that. And also I love documentary. So, you know, I had a I had a very lucky start because you see, we used to have the regional ITV system. And yeah. so Granada Television was absolutely top of its game. Um, and the BBC was much more London focused. It had got departments up here, but really, you know, um Granada was where to be and um and I was there and so you know I was working alongside Tony Wilson you know oh, wow. Steve Coogan, Carolina Hearn you know lots of brilliant talented people you know and Peter Kay later you know just fantastic people Paul Abbott you know I could literally just name drop for another two hours so I won't bother <laughs> it was just such a kind of talent of and hive of creativity yeah. That, you know, there were there were a lot of programs that were made there that were long running shows that enabled you know people like myself to develop from being. I was I was started at the BBC as a trainee, then became a researcher at the BBC, then went to Granada as a assistant producer, then rose to series producer, but also did you know produce direct my own documentaries, and then I decided to want to be on screen for a bit, so I actually did the first ever program about the internet as a reporter with Tony Wilson presenting. So oh, like, wow. He was a genius and, you know, it was 1995 and it was called The Program, spelt in the American way. And you can find it actually on YouTube and there's me kind of saying, telling people what an email is. Oh, an email <laughs> break because you just you don't have to bother printing out and putting it in a fax machine, you know, you just kind oh, of- Oh, amazing. It. Hilarious. Yeah. And I think it's really important what you said about programming in the North, you know, because we're all aware that, you know, the BBC has has moved a lot of operations up here. But, you know, one thing that I was really keen to talk to you about is to what extent that's really moved the needle on moving more of the media, produ media production outside London to the north. You know, how much of it is done up here now? And, you know, why is it so important that we do more media production regionally? It's incredibly important that the country feels it has a voice. You know, the mm. media has always been seen as, as absolutely vital as a way of kind of unifying the country, reflecting everybody's views. Um, and that's more important than ever at this time when we're very divided, you know, particularly with the whole Black Lives Matter debate. Yeah. And so, you know, without a base in the North, without a proper production base in the North, people like me would not be working in television. So I would, I have an unusual background. I was born in India. My dad's a mountaineer, you know, so he was over there teaching and climbing the Himalaya. So I came back to the UK and ended up in the Northeast. Yeah. And basically, um, sorry, my son's coming in. I'm on, I'm on a webinar. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> so, so, you know, so, so my career is quite unusual, but I know, I can tell you this. I started 
in um, in radio, age 15, I won a kind of, or came second, sorry, in a, news, a local yeah. news competition when I was 15 in the Northeast. So by 15, I then had um, the opportunity to co-present a radio show, which I did for three years. Yeah. And I also then presented at 16 a TV show. And to me, it was like, oh, my goodness, totally another world. And I just thought, I love this. This is yeah. great, you know. So I sat there in the old days, they had the old kind of brochures for universities. And I went through every brochure and I found the one course in the country where they taught you how to be producers because I knew that I'd be a better producer than presenter. So I found this course and it was Bristol University English and Drama. They had six places oh, wow. in the earth, six places. It was the most oversubscribed course in the country at the time. And I applied for it and I got on and I, you know, absolutely loved it. Um, but when I first arrived, the TV studio burnt down. And I'm like, oh, great, I've come all the way to Bristol. And the fucking studio from Stockton on Tees and the studio's burnt yeah. down. But anyway, what that meant is they they rebuilt it with a brand new colour TV studio. And they used yeah. to teach us, like, right, you're holding the boom all day. You're the director, but you're holding the boom all day. But I tell you, when you've held the boom all day, you get an empathy for what it's like to do that. And so when you're then, you know, producing, directing, you make yeah. sure you don't make your guy hold the boom or girl. Yeah. You know. Wow. Not all day without a break. <laughs> yeah. But I think that there's one other thing which I think is really interesting because even though, you know, obviously more media is being made in the North, you know, when we watch programmes, you know, and, and obviously there are exceptions to this, but there's still almost that stereotypical narrative of what it means to be in the North, you know. There's, there's almost still this attitude that it's kind of flat caps and whippets and you're going, hey, up, lad. And, you know, the truth is so different from that. But why do you think some of these really outdated northern stereotypes still exist? Because all the commissioners are in London and they're all of one type. So whereas we used to have, you know, a lot of people from different backgrounds coming into television, like the woman who mm. created with Simon Cowell, Britain's Got Talent and, um, you know, that whole generation of kind of shows. Um, she was a single mom, you know, she was a teenager when she had her first baby. There's no way she would have got into telly had it not been for Granada Television existing. Yeah. That's why I'm so passionate about it. There's so many people that I could tell you, you know all the writers, the wonderful writers. There are just so many people. We wouldn't have the television that we have at the moment if it wasn't for those regional companies and so when the government got rid of them in 2003 because there was such a lot of pressure from ITV to do that um, they wanted to be a national company and as soon as they yeah. were given permission of course they all went off to London with the headquarters down there um, they've still got a base up here but it's it's minimal in comparison with with what it was and the thing that's really missing is commissioning power you know so if you if the people that are making the decision as to what goes on telly are all from one class, they're all upper middle class because this is a mm. trendy job and you don't look at your watch all day, it's great, you know. So they all want it and obviously they've got money. So I compete against like a guy whose dad ran Bearings Bank and he fancied setting up an indie, so, you know, daddy supports him. Wow. Sam Johnson, whose daddy I know gave him <laughs> a million and a half in the first couple of years because a friend of mine worked for him. Yeah. So these are the people that I compete against. But I've done it for 13 years and I will carry on doing it because my ideas are really strong. But it is a creative meritocracy. You see, it should be, sorry, a creative meritocracy and it isn't yeah. at the moment. And, and I have literally been told when I was casting a series in Liverpool um, and I, they kept saying to me, no, this... You know, this woman that you've cast, she doesn't look like a Liverpool woman. You know, we need the kind of long blonde dyed hair. Really? We need very big eyelashes. We need the big tits, you know. Honestly, they reinforce stereotypes. Yeah. And do you think that's also playing out in terms of the kind of diversity and representation point? Because I know it's something that you're really passionate about. And it seems that in some ways, you know, again, you know, in some ways the needles move, but it seems in many ways that we still don't really have true diversity and representation whether it's class or gender or ethnicity in the media you know how good or bad a job do you think that the media in general are doing around diversity i think they're doing a terrible job i mean there was recently one broadcaster you know that were trying to find supposedly a, the current affairs and news kind of commissioning editor for the north um i know that a brilliant friend of mine who's black applied for it who's one of the most senior black 
people outside London. Mm. Um, Marcus Ryder, he's given me permission to to give his name. Um, he worked very closely with Lenny Henry. He still obviously works very closely with Lenny, trying to kind of increase diversity. He'd spent his whole career outside London. He knew everybody across the north and across Scotland. Um, you know, but the job was given to a Londoner, a white Londoner yeah. who commutes out of out of London. So it's it's about mentality. If you don't live among people, you don't understand what their concerns yeah. are. You don't know about what's happening in terms of the right wing campaigning that's going on at the moment in Morecambe. You don't understand, you know, how the people in Glasgow are feeling because you don't live there. If you're commuting to and fro from London, you won't represent. So when broadcasters talk about doing diversity all the time, but they don't actually do it, if, if, if you know, if I had an opportunity to employ a guy like Marcus, I would honestly, if I could afford it, I'd bring him into my company yeah. tomorrow. You know, he's a brilliant, He, I've learned more from Marcus as an exec producer than from almost any other, you know, exec producer that I've talked wow. to. He's a brilliant guy, honestly, yeah. and it just infuriates me. I want people to do diversity, not talk about it, and things won't change until they yeah. do. And that's, I mean, it was a bit funny. I was on a webinar earlier with a group of broadcasters and talking about, you know, how important diversity was. And of course, they were all white. And then there was one person, a, a British Asian person who joined us. But, you know, it is just that's the reality of it. Yeah. It's just tragic. And I tell you, with Songs Praise last weekend, what happened a week last Tuesday, one of my staff who, when we inherited Songs Praise in 2017, she came across as a researcher. Yeah. She kept sending me these brilliant ideas. And I was like, this woman is really good, you know. Um, Serena Pinto, she's a black woman, originally from Ireland, but lived here for ages. Anyway, I've promoted her with my partner, Amir. We've promoted her up. She's producer now of all our forward planning. She's absolutely oh, brilliant. brilliant. So a week last Tuesday, we were talking about another programme because we're just going back into production now. We've got the Archbishop of, Can of Canterbury, actually, in our first show, which goes out on the 5th of July, and we're celebrating the NHS. It's the NHS's birthday that day. Oh, wow, great. Yeah, so that's good. So we were talking yeah. about that programme. But then Serena just said, look, you know, I just think we should be doing something about George Floyd's death. And this was a week last Tuesday. And um, all the white people you know, in the meeting just said, no, don't think so. Wow. I really didn't know. I was kind of on the fence and I was like, I was listening and I was just thinking and, um, and I thought she's right. You know, we should do something because we had got a program going out. There was actually, you know, I said everybody had different ideas for the highlight programs. It's yeah. one of my ideas and it goes out this Sunday. It's called the great outdoors worship in the great outdoors. And it's a beautiful show but it's so light and so happy and so jolly. And I thought, crikey, if I'd have seen somebody who looked like my dad being killed by a policeman, tortured to death, I would want that reflected on some yeah. something, you know, to say whether it's the prayer or whatever. Anyway, so we started working on it, fortunately. And, and so that was the Tuesday. By the Wednesday, what happened is that um, we were out filming already on the Wednesday. I got a black producer, freelance producer in because obviously everybody else on the team was delegated. I changed the report. It had been, sorry, presenter. It had been Kate Botley. Um, we got Sean Fletcher in as a black um, presenter because I know that racism exists. As a yeah. woman, I've suffered a lot, you know, and so I know that racism exists and I know that I need people in those positions to make editorial decisions who understand racism. Um, who can therefore get the, the balance yes. right, you know? And so basically, um, yeah, we started filming on the Wednesday. By the Wednesday night, I was watching news at 10. Um, 15 minutes was about George Floyd. And I thought, yes, thank yeah. you, Serena. Thank you. Thank goodness I have a diverse team. Because if it hadn't been for Serena and if it hadn't been having a diverse team, I wouldn't have known. I wouldn't have made that decision myself. Wow. And... I think, you know, st just staying with this point for a moment, obviously, you know, even if we look at, you know, before we came on, I was having a look at leadership teams in media as well. And, you know, even though so many people in creative industries are women, there, there still seems to be that, that, you know, very shallow pyramid where there's not enough women on leadership teams. You know, it seems that, you know, alongside race, we, we still haven't moved the needle on female representation on media boards and has that been something that you've come across in your own career as well 
Well, I was made redundant for the second time, which is why I set up my business, you know, so kind of yes. I mean, I when I was younger, you know, I remember one guy saying to me, um, the problem is, Kat, you know, you've got two children. I'm not, I can't send you to Brazil tomorrow, should I want to, so I can't give you the job. And that was on World in Action. Wow. And so, you know, that's what it was like. You know, there was this attitude. But to be honest, I, I kind of feel that um, things have improved a lot. I think what's really important is that women remember what it was like, you know, and, and that they don't carry on making the same mistake of mm -hmm. clone recruiting. That's what it is. Yeah. They recruit people in a little club. Oh, I understand that person because they've got exactly the same background as me and therefore I'm going to employ them because I know I'll be able to communicate with them. Whereas actually we need, we all know, we need diverse teams to be creative. And my company is actually at the moment being studied by Manchester University because I have a oh, very wow. diverse team. This yeah. is with Nine Lives. So then some suppose we obviously we inherited a lot of the team. So it's not as diverse as I would like it to be if I'd have built it from scratch. But my personal team at Nine Lives is very, very, very diverse. And, and that's the way you get best creativity, you see. And um, it also means you can reflect the country, which is part of our job as broadcasters, because we need to unify the country. And um, a lot of, you know, we also need post-Brexit to be doing business with people all over the world. And obviously, I spend a lot of time in India. My godparents are Indian. Um, you know, my um, we've got lots of friends there. And, you know, if people think that India thinks the empire was great, then they are just kidding themselves. So those yeah. actors, I mean, honestly, we're a laughing stock. I remember I was there with my dad and my dad is quite pro empire because obviously his generation, you know, he grew up with a big pink map and it must've been exciting, you know, but get over it, you know. I mean, it was so funny. We were, we were, we were invited to go down to a friend of mine runs a charitable school in the foothills of the Himalaya and it's the most beautiful place. And it's all, they just poured all their yeah. money, everything into educating the villagers' children. And, um, so we went down to see this and my dad was there and we were sitting on the front row and the children kind of sat up and stood up and said, you know, they're talking about, it's to celebrate Indian independence day, they're talking about Indian history. And it was yeah. like, and then the British came and the British robbers took all our wealth and took it back to Britain. And just yeah. kind of you know, that kind of sentiment. And I was looking across at my dad because I thought he's going to go mad. But of course he just smiled through it because it just went over his head because that's the attitude of some people is they won't face the reality yeah. of empire. And yes, you know, the, the train system was brilliant. You know, the trains were invented here, the railway system in something like 1825. They were rolled out across India by about, you know, within about 20 years which was a miracle and amazing but you know it doesn't mean that they think it was good that we were there yeah and i think it's interesting you know i mean we'll we'll we're going to come on to kind of you know manchester in a moment and then i'll I'll hand over to dale but i think you're right about those perceptions and i think this is where the media have a really interesting job of filling in those gaps in history that aren't taught things such as empire things such as colonialism which can really help to shape people's understanding of why ethnic groups do feel the way they do or what's has what's informed those fears yeah why they feel the way they do in this country yeah. why if we want to do business with india we've got to kind of you know grow up get educated understand things from that yeah. yeah and it's, it's interesting i only realized this when we met um at venture fest last year but but you, we have a shared India connection, which is that you were born in Rajkot in Gujarat, as as was my mum. So so we are both of Indian heritage, which which is quite a wonderful yeah, I'm a, fact I'm a for us to know. I we am, are. I am. I mean, to be honest, I kind of whenever I go to India, because those were all my first memories and the first sounds and everything, yeah. and it was very moving at Christmas. I went to see my godfather and. Um, and my nanny, my old nanny, my Aya was there and she just couldn't let go of me. It was oh. so cool. And then, I, and then I discovered, which I hadn't known, that I was the only baby she'd had because, you know, that because she'd never had her own children. So I was her baby, you know, and honestly, oh, wow. it's just so beautiful. She's the most wonderful, wonderful people. It's such an honour and a privilege to be born in India, to have a connection with such an extraordinary country, with such a rich yeah. history. It's just wonderful. It is a really special place. Um, but of course, you know, so is Manchester. And there's one thing which I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, when we had our chat the other day, and I was so pleasing to hear about your passion for the city. And so before I kind of hand over to Dale, I'd love to just, you know, get your views on, 
you know, you, you've made programs about Manchester. You've got you've done a lot of research about the city as well in your in your life. But what is it for you that makes Manchester such a special place to live and to build your business as well? It's all about the people, and I genuinely did choose it for the people. So. The, the best quote, and, and I, I meant to kind of look it up, you know, so that I could give you it, but um, it's when President Lincoln, you know, said that we were, um, that the Manchester people were just, that set an example to the world, and that was because they basically stood up to um, to support the end of slavery in America, even though it meant that they starved because the cotton famine happened here because we couldn't get the raw cotton. So in Liverpool, they supported the other side. In <laughs> Liverpool, they wanted to kind of, you know, um, the, the slavers to win. But in Manchester, we wanted freedom for the slaves. We wanted, we, we, we abhorred the whole thing. And the yeah. people literally starved, um, it, it, you know, because they understood and they sent support. You know, and um, and that's when, you know, Lincoln statue in it's Lincoln Square, isn't it? The statue of yeah. Lincoln. You can read the whole thing. And it's it's really worth doing just off Deansgate, in between Deansgate and then in front of the town hall. But there's also, you know, the women's liberation movement. There's the um, the start of the cooperative movement just outside Manchester. There's the um, beginning of the modern vegetarian movement. There's the fact that we started the Reform Act. There's the fact we decided to bring the sea from Liverpool because it was only fair, because they took so much tax when our exports and imports were going either way. So, you know, and we did bring the sea to Manchester, you know, through the Manchester Ship Canal. And that took 100,000 people on the streets of Manchester protesting for that to get through Parliament. Because at the wow. time, Liverpool had three MPs. Lancashire, the whole of Lancashire had one. And then wow. the Manchester people fought for the Reform Act and they lost their lives at Peterloo you know, in order to get representation of the people. So every area across the whole country had a constituency MP. The Manchester people basically created the modern democracy that we have as a country. And people don't know this history, but that's why I'm here. Wow. And it's it's always so inspiring to kind of, you know, hear you speak so passionately about the city. You know, I, I was born here myself and then Weirdly, I've only really had that sense of place and sense of pride for the city in recent years as I've got more into the history of Manchester. It's made me proud to be a Mancunian um, via Indian descent. But I'd love to now just bring in Dale because we've had a whole bunch of questions that have been submitted and I'm sure we've had lots of questions on the live stream as well. So, so welcome back, Dale. Oh, we can't hear you, Dale. Oh yeah, Dale, we can't hear you. Sorry, that was me. No <laughs> problem. Um, uh, no, thank you so much again. What an insightful session and some, some real great insight. Um, so yeah, we do have some uh, pre-submitted questions. For first question, Kat is: How does it feel to be a woman in the media after all the issues with Me Too? Yeah, I'm a victim. Unfortunately, you know, I was raped when I was 16. When I was a virgin, it was really hard. You know, when I was a TV presenter by one of the producers. So you know. And as a consequence, I suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so it's very difficult. You know, I've had anxiety since kind of a couple of months after that happened. But I fight through it. And I believe it's incredibly important for us to get our voice out. You know, when I was a little kid, I used to kind of draw pictures and write stories and pin them on the garage wall and like get a jug together of juice and kind of invite the neighbours round to kind of drink the juice. and you know, um, read my stories. That was the main thing. I just wanted to get my stories out there. So that's what I'm still doing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's mm -hmm. a very serious issue. I mean, you know, it's just, that's only the start of it. Um, you know, I mean, basically, I think a lot of men who grew up in the 70s and were watching, or were adults in the 70s and were just watching kind of, you know, all those terrible programs like the Benny Hill stuff, you know, that just made them think they could just, you know, have sex with whoever they wanted, when they wanted. Um, it was a terrible era. And I think for my generation, it was particularly bad because, you know, because people knew that the pill and abortion were available. So, you know, sex lost any kind of, um, what's the word, just kind of, there was no respect, you know. So it's it, it, it's been a terrible time to grow up, really, I think. Okay, thank you, and, and, and so very brave to, to share that with us. Next question is from uh, Trailer Park Productions, uh, asking, how do they get noticed as an early stage production company? 
I think the best thing to do, I mean, it was really interesting. I spoke to um, a young woman um, this week who was wanting to work in television um, and she had the most fabulous ideas. And so I'm literally giving her a contract from Monday because I think if you judge people on their ideas, you know, then there's a real meritocracy to that. It doesn't matter what background you come from. You can watch telly, you can have ideas, you can introduce us to new worlds. So, um, so basically what I would say is that obviously if a broadcaster is giving a company, you know, £50,000, £100,000, you know, whatever the budget is, they want to know that you're going to deliver. So I think you need to find a company that you will go into business with, you know, and do a co-production or maybe two co-productions. And I do that with companies at the moment. I've got um, a company's just approached me. I've got to, you know, do my heads of terms and send those down to him tomorrow. So, you know, I think that's the way really, because then the broadcaster thinks, oh, that's great. We know cattle deliver, you know, so they're not worried, you know, in that way. And, I, and I'm really happy to train people. I think a lot of people, when they get to my stage, in life, they want to kind of mentor and train the next generation. Mm -hmm. um, next question from, from the live feed is, how do you identify and re re retain talent within our industry? I think it's about access. And I think that, you know, um, it's about making sure that, that people can get through the door. And that's why the move of Channel 4 out of London to the north is incredibly important. That's why, um, you know, it's incredibly important that the BBC is doing more in the North. I mean, I just think that we've got to provide people with enough work. That's the key. We can't have everything being made in London. We found out how how the companies and the broadcasters were cheating um, the regulation that used to exist. It was very complex. I mean, I'd literally, and I feel like I, I must have been kind of totally blinkered not to have seen it earlier, but I was, um, when people tell you one thing and do another, uh, when people are talking in tongues effectively it's very difficult isn't it but um but basically what they were doing is um it, it's i don't want to bore you but you know the regulation that had been devised in order to ensure that the communications act was was actually regulated properly there were three boxes that you had to tick and one of the boxes was you had to tick that you had an office outside london that was operating yeah what they were doing is they were ticking that box but they do the production in london but they did have an office outside london but they just wouldn't do the production outside london so what what we made sure that this new regulation does which comes in in january is that they can only tick to say a production qualifies if it's actually made in that office outside london and that's a huge difference because they were even bringing runners up runners like literally straight out of it they were bringing runners up from london i've never i've never known the industry be this posh like that job you know it was 40 years ago i started in telly in 1980 40 years ago with that when i was that competition you know and then 39 years ago when i did that thing when i was 16 and you know and the industry is now a different industry you know it really is it's london based we are we are not a one city state you know, I love Singapore, but we're not Singapore. You know, we're not London poor. You know, well, we would be if, if, if people carry on with that attitude that we would be poor. Mm. Because we are a rich, diverse country with wonderful history and wonderful people all over. And we need to take a national attitude, not a London yeah. attitude. And just, just on, on that one, Kat, do you think we also need to encourage more people to look at kind of supporting film through investment because you know you know one of our businesses uh which is you know small independent film production company and we keep coming across this time and time again where all the film funders are in london or isle of man and there's there's very little encouragement of you know high net worths or business people or others to actually support film and support production outside those sort of areas I had a, a really interesting chat um, with Marcus, actually, and one of the things that he and Lenny are thinking about doing is trying to get um, a kind of scheme where there's investment for, you know, diverse companies, mm -hmm. which I think would be brilliant, and tax breaks, perhaps, you know. Um, and I think that, you know, that's, that's definitely the way to go. I think that, um, you know, it, it, it's difficult because it's not, you know, it's a creative industry. And even if somebody has a fantastic track record, you don't know 100% what's going to be a hit, which is one of the exciting things about what we do. But, um, but yes, I think investment's always important. I think the problem with the London-centric 
nature that we have in this in this country, which is almost like a sickness, is that people tend to kind of invest in London. And I actually think in many ways, when people look back, you know, historically, when they're in a hundred years time, when they're looking back, they'll say that the true digital age began on the 23rd of March, 2020, because that's when we all started using Zoom. That's when we all had to work at home, you know, and just email isn't it you know we've been saying for years oh you don't have to travel to America I literally attended a conference in in Canada last week you know from here from my little bedroom you know well office so it's kind of you know I mean, it's great that we can do that and it does level the playing field to an extent as well which is great it's not I was having to go down to London you know as everybody was I mean I once because we had a problem with the trains I once interviewed a lot of people on the train and typical Manchester people they were literally they were all just like you know, there was this one woman, she was so beautiful, she was sitting on the floor. And I said, why are you sitting on the floor? She said, well, I have to get this train because I have to save save my department some money. She was a department wow. and she was saving that department money by getting the peak time train, you know, the first peak time train, that seven o'clock from Euston that we all know and we all hate because it's so overcrowded because yeah. this ticket pricing policy which resulted in this terrible overcrowded situation that quite frankly, I think breaks health and safety law, but um, that's another matter mm. because they could anticipate that that was going to happen by that ticket pricing policy. Yeah. And just before we come back to you, Dale, I think just, yes. just, just, to re, just to reinforce that point, I think one of the things which, which is often not, not spoken about is just the sheer amount of employment created by the creative industries. And, you know, right now people are backing technology and there's a really interesting productivity measure, which is if you look at the sort of revenue of a business or of a industry and then look at the amount of employment that those industries create, you know, the creative industries are up there with industry and many industrial sectors and manufacturing in terms of numbers of jobs. And I really wish that was discussed more when we talk about backing the creative industries. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So, um, next question is a COVID related question. So, uh, what do you feel will be the longest term impact of, of the COVID situation on your business and the creative industry? Well, I think whilst we're in this time where it's kind of, you know, post lockdown, pre vaccination or, or cure, um, we've just all got to be incredibly careful. So, we've all got very, very long protocols you know to keep our staff safe to keep our contributors safe it's particularly hard for drama we obviously can't film kind of hymns congregational hymns the way we usually do for songs of praise we're going to have to have choirs more performances thankfully we've got a huge library because it's our 60th birthday next year so we've got a huge okay. library of, of hymns but it's you know we've just got to kind of mainly um but but you know what necessity is the mother of invention and, and I had a pilot for a dating show commissioned just before all this. And um, the wonderful thing is we've all got together as a team and kind of been thinking about ideas. And one of my friends created Come Dine With Me. And so she amazingly came up with, she just was inspired. And I was kind of feeling really worried about the whole thing. And she just came up with this brilliant way that we can do it to make it kind of COVID safe. And um, it's actually far, far better than it was it'll be an amazing show now whereas it would have been a good show but I don't think it would have been the level it's going to be and it's got a real USP so I do think you've got to be positive and just think actually when you have boundaries as a creative person it often forces you to to, to work harder and to think more and to come up with something even better oh wow yeah. yeah, wow. Okay, I've got a question around uh, mentorship. So as a young entrepreneur, I'm often told that uh, I should have a mentor for me and my business. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's a really, really good idea. But I think it's kind of what's really good, I think, at the beginning um, is to set out kind of what, you know, what you feel that you want to get out of it. And also what I feel is I believe in project-based mentoring. Yeah, I, I actually had Stephen Lambert, who's amazing as a mentor, but I just felt too bad about it. I just thought I can't I can't trouble him, you know. So I only ended up going to see him a couple of times. I think the best thing is to do a co-production with somebody or to if you're if you're not a production company, if you're a, um, you know, a would be kind of series producer or would be, you know, whatever position you're in, try and get a project. So it's project based mentoring. 
So essentially what you're saying is kind of, you know, who do I want to work with in this industry? Who do I want to learn from? Oh, that person. Right. I'm going to try and get a co-production with them or I'm going to try and get a job with them or I'm trying to get this with them. And then if you, if it is a job, then when you get your job, you just say, well, I would really like you to be my mentor. And then you set out clear objectives. But if it's based on a project, then it's much more satisfying rather than just sitting around talking. Let's just do something because we're creative people. We do things, don't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a question around the, the BAFTA and Oscars. So we hear about the lack of diversity in the awards, such as the Oscars and the BAFTAs. Do you believe there's any issues here in the Northwest? I think there's issues across the whole industry. Basically, this is an industry that it's really easy for trustafarians to get into because it's insecure at times, you know, because we have that project base. As I say, I employ a core staff year round and I employ the whole of Songs of Praise year round. But, you know, essentially this project based, you know, kind of um, aspect of the industry means that if you've got the bank of mom and dad to rely on, then it's a lot easier for you to break in. It's a lot easier for you to stay in, um, you know, for the first couple of years. Because, I mean, my son, you know, he, he started on the, this morning um, as a runner about three years ago. And he was living in London. The amount of money he was being paid didn't cover his rent. So fortunately, he's lucky. He's maybe part of the problem. But, you know, I was able to kind of help fund his accommodation. He was on a zero hour contract. You know, I had to kind of be there for the support, you know. And unfortunately, that means somebody from a poorer family isn't going to have that opportunity, um, which is wrong because it means the industry isn't representative, which means you get kind of these terrible reinforcement of stereotypes and and quite frankly you know it should be the people with the best ideas who get the airtime and they don't all come from the upper middle class i actually think upper middle class people generally are boring <laughs> oh um okay probably final question time for one more so if you could advise your younger self of two things as you start started out your entrepreneurial journey what would they be um as an entrepreneur well, I got really good advice, actually. What I did is I, when I set up the Indie Club in 2006, it was purely altruistic in that I genuinely wanted to kind of, for us to communicate after ITV had taken most of their jobs to London. Mm -hmm. I wanted the independents to communicate better so that we could retain talent so that if I'd got a really good assistant producer that I would pass them on to another person, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and to keep talent in the North rather than them all migrating to London. Um, but what, what it meant is that when I decided, because I was made redundant in um, the summer of 2007, I just thought, well, I might as well set up, try and set up an indie because I've got nothing to lose. And so um, I went and took people out for lunch from the indie club. And one of the women, Louise Lynch, they weren't all women, by the way, but, um, you know, I spoke to this one woman, Louise Lynch, and she said, well, the great thing when I set up, because I didn't have any savings and she hadn't had any savings, she said I went straight into production. So I managed to do a deal with... The people that I'd been working with, um, they were making me redundant. So I did a deal that I took this series with me. Now I had a pilot for a program and I and I thought, well, maybe I could do the same thing. So I phoned up the commissioner and um, and I said, look, if, if I was making this particular pilot through my own company, would you commission it from me? And he said, yes. <laughs> and I still remember exactly where I was at the time. And he also gave me, he's a wonderful mentor to me, actually, Richard Melman, he's amazing. But he also gave me like brilliant advice because he said, look, always keep your overheads low and always kind of, you know, know that you're going to be working on Sundays, which is true. You know, you just are oh, for the first few years at least. But but that series that he commissioned the pilot of, and I did a deal with the people that were making me redundant. It's actually Noel Edmonds company. And I said to them, look, you know, if I take this pilot, you know, can that be part of my redundancy? And, and I gave them some money for it. But basically, yeah, I got the pilot and that ended up with a, um, a six part, a six, six series, six. Yes. Yeah, six, six series of five programs so 30 programs later. And they're still selling around the world. So that, you know, I just I had to check for 25,000 the other day for one of those series. So it's great. You know, I'm not a, a bank payment. I'm giving away my age. <laughs> Wow, incredible. And I'm sure we could continue uh, all evening from some really great questions there. Thank you so much, Kat. Yeah. Vikas, I'll hand back to you just to, to wrap up and also maybe give us some insight to, around next week. Great. So, first of all, thanks so much, Kat, for your time. It's been, been such a pleasure 
having you with us. It's been you know really enjoyable to hear your story, your views on media. And, you know, I'm just looking forward to doing this again when you can. And just, you know, for everyone who's watched, thanks for joining us this okay. evening. Um, you know, we're, we're doing these every week. And towards the start of the week, we'll send out an email to everyone uh, advising who's coming on and submit your questions in advance or on the live stream. And all of these sessions will be available to view afterwards as well. So we'll circulate those details. So thanks again for joining us, Kat. Uh, have a lovely rest of the evening and a lovely rest of the evening, everyone who's watching. So thank you.